Today we're gonna to go over the basics of slow pitch jigging and how to become compliant with IGFA rules and regulations for the purposes of landing a world record fish. I'm Zach, I'm here with George from Jig Pro Fishing. Hey guys, so this is a great opportunity for us. Thank you, first, first of all, thank you so much for having us here. And this is finally gonna give us some clarity, the jigging world, about how we can apply the IGFA rules to our jigging game. So there's a few basic rules uh, that you guys need to know on how to set up your jigs to become compliant with IGFA angling rules and therefore um, become compliant with the world record requirements when you do end up catching that large fish. So the first being you're allowed a maximum of three hooks on your jig. A lot of these jigs are set up with four hooks but those would be considered illegal under IGFA angling rules. So three hooks is the maximum amount of hooks you're allowed to have with your jig. Uh, another rule to focus on would be that the bend of the hook can be no more than four inches uh, from where where the assist hook setup meets the jig. So that'd be four inches, including your lead down to the bend of the hook. Um, and then the other important one would be that that lead can be no more than one half the length of the hook. So the length of the hook would be from the eye to the bend, and that lead would be from the connection of the jig to the eye of the hook. Those are the basic ones that people get hung up on sometimes. And if you can understand that, you're gonna be compliant with IGFA angling rules and therefore have a better opportunity to catch a world record fish. All right, so let me ask you one question here. Is that matter, the order of where you put the single hook or the twin hooks? Or it does not matter. You know, you can have two hooks up top, one hook down below. You can also run a jig like this with a single hook up top and a single hook down below. Where you locate these hooks did not matter. So these will all be compliance pretty much, right? Correct. Even like these ones just having a set on top? Yeah, everything we have in front of us here today is compliant with these IJFA angling rules. All right, so just to clarify, so a max of three hooks per jig, no matter what those hooks are, right? Correct, yes. For as long as the length of the uh, line is no longer than four inches from the actual bend, right? Yeah, so it would be the connection from the top of the jig or bottom of the jig, wherever your, your assist hook is set up. The connection to the bend of the hook can be no more than four inches. Okay. And then the second rule is that your, your lead length, so the connection from the eye of the hook uh, to the jig itself, can be no more than one half of the length of the hook from the bend to the eye. All right. I mean, that makes a lot of sense to me. That definitely clarifies a lot of the questions that I had. I hope that helps as well to our jigging community here. So now, can you help us understand what is actually not allowed to do? Uh, because I get this question all the time. And you know, we, when we are sloppy jigging, the traditional Japanese way was to have uh, twin assists on top and twin assists on the bottom, a total of four hooks. Uh, is that allowed? It's not allowed. Uh, under IGFA angle rules, like I said earlier, you're allowed a maximum of three assist hooks uh, per jig, right? So. For example, this setup with two hooks on top would be legal. If you were to add those two hooks to the bottom, that would make it illegal. It would have four total assist so hooks. That is not allowed. So that I want to make it allowed. very clear out there. Unfortunately for us, guys, we're going to have to start changing some things in here because this is not allowed. Um, if we want to qualify for a world record, uh, it will allow like these and it will allow with one single hook or a treble hook. Or a treble hook, but the treble hook cannot be an assist hook. Um, it, you can't have any lead, it has to be connected directly to the jig with a snap swivel. Okay, and then going back to the treble hook uh, um, question as well. Uh, I have a lot of customers, I know a lot of people that jig, that use treble hooks in their jigs. What is the policy with the treble hooks on the jig? So if you're gonna put treble hooks on your jigs, um, you cannot have them be assist hooks, which would include a lead. The, the treble hooks have to be connected directly to the jig with a snap swivel, and that would then turn them into a lure uh, in the eyes of the IGFA angle rules. All right, Zach, this is another tricky question for you. I'm sorry, there's so many of these. So um, let's talk about treble hooks and IGFA rules. So are we allowed to use treble hooks on a jig, and where can we put those treble hooks? So you are allowed to use treble hooks on a jig, um, but there's very specific setups where they'd be considered allowed. Um, so they would be considered illegal if they were set up as an assist hook, which would include having a lead, um, as you have here with these single hooks. What would be considered legal is if you connected them directly with the jig with a split ring. You can have a single treble hook uh, at the bottom of your jig connected with a split ring and then assist hooks on top. And you can also have two treble hooks connected with split rings. That actually changes the language and makes it considered a lure in, in our IGF angling rules, not necessarily a jig in that sense. But both of those setups I just described would be considered legal. The only thing that would be considered illegal using treble hooks is if you have them uh, set up with a lead, which would make them considered an assist hook. Okay. So essentially, treble hooks are like just simple hooks, right? Correct. So yeah. even they have three hooking points, it's still considered a hook. Yeah. 
Perfect. So Zach, now that we're getting more into details and you talked us through the actual uh, hook configuration in the jig, I think that was like the most confusing part, but I know there is some more rules that apply as well to the line. My question to you is like, can you define like the different line categories and, and what does all of that mean to, to the yeah. general public? So the IGFA currently holds um, all tackle world records, right? So that's for open and available for every species. The requirements are that you still need to be uh, in compliance with IGFA angling rules, which allows for a maximum of 130 pound test breaking strength line. Okay. Um, so if you're jigging with, you know, eight pound braid, 20 pound braid, anything under 130, you can qualify for that all tackle world record. Okay. We also hold line class world records for specific set of fish, which um, you can find here in our book on our website, igfa.org. So for those species, depending on the size of them, we hold line classes ranging, you know, two, four, six, eight, 12, 16, 20, some all the way up to 80 to 130 pound line class records for them. And so for those records, you have to be using line that breaks at or under um, the pound test uh, that you're gonna be going for. So for example, if you, if you catch a, a fish and you're going for the eight pound line class record, that line has to break under 8.8 .8 pounds or four kilograms to be considered compliant with that record. Okay. So it's not what the actual packaging says. It's not what the actual packet says. And oftentimes braided line will, you know, advertise themselves as being eight pound test braid and uh, it's very strong material. And, you know, we'll break it after somebody submits it for a world record and it'll break at 22, sometimes 27 pounds of break strike. And it's unfortunate because they go through all that effort, you know, to land the world record, you know, apply properly and the line is what holds them back from getting the, the record at the end of the day. So is there any methods that we can do to prevent them having 10 reels with 10 different lines? Yeah, so um, you actually only really need five meters of um, what's considered your line class uh, right. when you're fishing. So um, what you can do is you can run whatever your standard braid is, you know, 10, 15 pound braid as your backing, and then you can put a top shot. I often suggest just going with 20 feet um, to be safe on that. And you can use monofilament that, it, you know, tests properly. Um, there's certain uh, companies that make monofilament they pre-test, and that can ensure you that, you know, you go through all that effort to catch and submit a record and the line isn't what holds you back because you have that pre-tested mono as your top shot. Okay, so it's a lot simpler than it looks, right? So pretty much if you are applying for the eight pound category, you can have whatever braid you want in your reel and then put a 20 piece, 20 feet piece of that monofilament, eight pound, yeah. properly test and everything, and then your leader and you are still applying for, for for whatever that monofilament is. It's considered your line class, and, and by the book, it's considered the line that immediately precedes your leader. Um, so what comes directly after your leader is gonna be considered your line class. All right, well, that simplifies a lot of the things because I thought you had to carry like 20 rails with you. So just to clarify, this makes it a lot simpler than I thought. So then if, if, if I'm trying to uh, to chase a world record for a, for a red grouper or for a man snapper, I can simply have uh, bring with me three pieces of nylon, right? Three pieces of monofilament, uh, one ready for eight pound, one for 12, what, what is it, like eight? Eight, uh, 12, 16. 20. Eight, 12, 16, and then for as long as they're 20 feet and they are uh, in between my braid and my leader, it still qualifies. Correct, yes. That simplifies a lot of things. Yeah. So like now we talk about the line class and the old, old tackle record, and we know a little better about that. So now, do you have any restrictions when it comes down to the leader, the length? the size we do so the restrictions we have are, are the length of the leader we actually um, don't have any restrictions on you know the size um, right so like we said with the all tackle record the max amount of the line you're allowed to use is 130 pounds of breaking strength but that is not the same for leader your leader material can actually be made up of anything um, okay. anglers going after fish you know some toothier fish can use steel leader um, what, what there is requirements on is uh, the actual length of that leader right so for line classes 20 pound and under you're allowed a maximum of 15 foot of leader and then for any line class over 20 to up to 130, you're allowed up to 30 foot of leader. Oh wow, so the diameter or the composition of the leader does not matter for as long as it's 15 foot for that uh, line class, right? Yeah, or 30 foot if uh, you're going above 20 pound line class. Oh, that makes it really interesting. So for all you guys that are trying to catch wahoo or kingfish or any of these species on the jig, you can actually use a piece of, lead, uh, a piece of steel on it and it still is fine, it's still right? still IGFA legal. Okay. That's very interesting. All right, Zach, now that we cover uh, the basics on the line and the leader and all that information that is needed, 
Do we have to really worry about the rod in any way? Do we, is there anything that we need to know specifically about the rod? Yes, yeah, so there are some uh, requirements with the, the rod length. I know a lot of uh, jigging fishermen you know, like to use shorter rods. So to become IGFA compliant, your rod has to be at least a minimum of 40 inches uh, from the, the bottom of the center of the reel, the reel seat, to the tip of the rod. And the butt, which would be the center of the reel, the reel seat, to, to the end of the rod, can not exceed 27 inches in length. Okay, so from the middle of my reel, all the way to the tip, at least 40 at inches. At least 40 inches. Um, from the middle of my reel to the back, max 27 max inches. Max 27, cannot exceed 27 All inches. right, well, you guys keep that in mind because as we get into that deeper water jigging, we're using shorter rods, so obviously now we have to consider like not getting too short. All right, Zach, before we jump into the next segment, um, before we move on from the system segment, right, the raw reel and line, I want to make it very clear no electric reels allowed. No electric reels allowed. Yeah, so you have to be using hand crank. Um, you cannot be using electric reel uh, to catch an IGFA record. All right, for, 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 I use sometimes electric reels to catch my golden tiles. Now, if I want to catch a world record golden tile, maybe I, I got to start thinking differently. So, yeah, and that's why there is a lot of world record backhands as well for the deeper water fish because with technology, electric reels came in place and a lot of people are deep dropping with these electric reels, but if you catch uh, 20 pound mystic grouper, that could be a potential world record. You catch an electric rail. Or... Disqualified, right. yeah. And so a lot of these species are vacant and, and available because there's been you know, no other style of fishing besides using electric reel you know, to be able to catch them. So now that you know, slow pitch jigging has come in, come in and, and you can start catching these, these fish mm -hmm. within IGFA compliance, these record opportunities can be available to everyone. And now let's get more into like real life scenario. And uh, hopefully this opens a lot of questions as well for everybody, but like, Let's say I'm, I'm fishing on a, you know, three or 400 feet of water and I hooked into a decent fish and I think I potentially could have a world record. What are the things that I need to keep in mind from that moment that I hug the fish until that fish is on the boat. So the main thing that I would keep in mind uh, and you could be protective about is that no one else is allowed to touch the rod or assist you in any way besides yourself, right? So, so a mate can't come underneath and, and bump into the rod and you know, you have to be the person that fights that fish. This is a solo mission. Yes. Okay. And uh, so when that fish gets close to the boat and you get towards the end game and you're thinking about gaffing it, you also, the, no one else can touch the main line. So the mate can't touch the main line, um, but they are allowed to touch the leader, right? So we talked earlier about your maximum leader length. So right. Say you have that 15 foot of leader, you know, once that comes up and is within reach, the mate can grab that and, you know, then it's considered a caught fish at that point. And then from that point forward, you know, whatever they do, you know, you can set the rod down, help him. Okay. Um, yeah, you just have to make sure that you, you've grabbed onto that leader and it's considered a caught fish. And then you can gaff your fish or net it however you see fit to land it. So I need to keep the rod with me the whole time, not put the rod in the rod holder, right? I have to hold this whole thing. Yeah. And, uh, and once the leader is up, then I and somebody touches that little that fish is considered considered caught, caught. fish. Yeah. And then what happens from that point on is is okay. Correct. Um, and now let me ask you. Um, this might be a tricky question, but let me ask you about like what happens if you catch a fish that is a potential world record, but it's off season. You know, here in, in South Florida we have very specific grouper seasons. Yes. Uh, you know, you are in the winter time in the East Coast and you catching a potential red grouper world record, but it's January. Yeah, so, do do? so to become compliant with IGFA world record regulations, uh, you have to follow state and local um, fishery regulations, right? So if, if a season is closed for a specific species and you can't retain that fish, so then obviously you can't bring it back to land to weigh the fish and you wouldn't be able to get a record. Okay. Uh, that's another thing that uh, would be helpful to talk about in this situation is that, um, you know, jigging, you're going to be offshore a lot. Um, when you're weighing a world record fish, you have to be on um, dry land. Your, your feet have to be touching the surface of the earth. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so in in order to get a world record uh, when you're jigging more often than not, you're going to have to kill the fish, right? So if, if, if it's out of season then and you would be breaking that you know, federal or state law by killing that fish, then you also couldn't be applying for a world record. But I could apply for a length world record, right? Correct. Yeah, so uh, separate from our all tackle or line class records, um, we hold all tackle length records. Specifics on that are that you have to be carrying an IGFA measuring device with you. Fish needs to be measured on that measuring device. Um, what I need to see is a photo of of the entire fish on the device, so mm -hmm. I can ensure that the you know the length that you're providing me in that photo is accurate, um, and then you're actually required to release the fish. So this would be helpful for fish who have closed seasons, right? Um, if you're fishing out of season for grouper and you happen to catch one that would be considered the all tackle length record, you can still get that record as long as you follow those steps. Okay, well, 
There you go. That's very interesting. Uh, I know we deal with a lot of these, especially here in South Florida with that grouper season being closed for, for so long or whatnot. And uh, yeah, that, that covers a big part. Now, let's get more into like the actual submitting world record process. Uh, I know everybody is like scared of these, <laughs> these things like, you know, this is this like worldwide association. By the way, these guys are like super cool. Like they're like <laughs> down to earth. You, you can call, call them and everything. We're, we're fishermen just like you guys. Yeah, so <laughs> it's nothing like super formal in here. I mean, they have rules, but um, you know, they're super easy to reach. Uh, so if you have a world record, a potential world record, or a question, just yeah. feel you know, free reach to give it. me a call anytime, guys. Yeah, so we're gonna drop his, his his phone number and email here, so you you have those questions, you can reach out to them. But I know the process can sound like bureaucratic in some way. Yeah. Um, so what does that process look like? So from the moment that I catch a potential world record and I landed it, um, let's say I know you guys sell some of your certified scales, so that's the ideal part to to have. I have one of those myself. Yeah. But if if you are uh, in a remote place and you catch a potential world record, you go on the, on the website and you see, oh, look, I did everything right. I think I have a potential world record. What do I need to do to actually make it go through? So the uh, main thing, and like you mentioned, so we, we do certify scales. We actually don't sell any certified scales, but if you were to purchase uh, any scale, digital, spring scale, um, under 100 pounds, we could certify it here at the IGFA. Uh, I've done that for you in the past. Yep, yep. And anything you know over 100 pounds, if you have a scale, I know there's handheld scales that read up to 1,000 pounds these days. You can get it certified by any other organization um, as long as it's within certification and we have a, a date to prove that, um, it's considered legal for IGFA records. So the certified scale obviously is going to be your first thing um, now you can go to a bait tackle shop uh, if you're in a remote country even restaurants I've had people go to restaurants as long as they have a certified scale that, that you'll be all right uh, if you weigh your fish on that scale you just need to make sure that you take a photo of the scale not necessarily the fish on the scale but of the scale and of that certification sticker so we can see that's within the date and you'll be good to go there okay and then so now finally I go the face of a lifetime I I, I know now it's a world record. I'm, I'm trying to file that process and follow through that process. And I found finally a certified scale. What else do I need to bring you when it comes down to the jigging wall? What is it that you need to see in person to verify? So we need, there's four main photos that we need to see that you would submit with your application. It's of the angler with the fish, the like I just said, the scale and a picture of that certification. And then a photo of the rod and reel. Now it doesn't necessarily have to be, I mean, we would like it to be uh, the day you know you caught the fish, but we just need a photo of the rod and reel. It can be on a table, you know, in a room. We just need to make sure that, you know, it's within compliance to the length regulations like we spoke about earlier. Um, then what you would need to do is you need to send in your tackle. I actually have an example of it here. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to keep the jig, the leader, uh, especially if you've just caught a world record and you know, you're know you pretty confident, I would take the jig um, whole set up off immediately, right? I wouldn't continue to fish with it. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to pull out about 50 feet of your main line. And in, in the way we've been discussing it, that would include your line class, braid backing, and your leader. Still okay. attach the jig. You'd cut that off. We don't necessarily require you to send in the jig itself, but we do need to measure um, the lead lengths on your assist hooks if you're using them. Okay. So what you can do is you can take the split ring off, um, still attached to your leader material, mm -hmm. and wrap that around a piece of cardboard. It's really easy to do. You just make an incision on either side, start with the braided backing line, start wrapping it around until you end up with the hook. Um, and this is really easy to send in along with your application form, fits in an envelope perfectly. Uh, and then, you know, you obviously, you know, you could either go back to the scales or keep fishing with a different setup. All right, well, that's a lot simpler than I thought. Yeah. Um, so you really don't, you don't need a video or anything of the, of the fight. That's, you don't have to have a whole production behind it. If you think you have a fish that is a potential world record and you follow all the steps prior to catching the fish, um, you only need like those four pictures and then your assist hooks, 50 feet of line that includes your potential um, class line, your leader and that main line we should be good to go. Yeah, and um, you don't necessarily have to, you know, film the fight, but what I always tell people is, you know, any information you can provide me mm -hmm. is, is gonna be better. Uh, witnesses, you're not necessarily required to have a witness, right? But, um, you know, any witness testimony you have to your catch also you know, helps your cause. And you don't necessarily actually have to have, you know, like we are describing with the line class, if you're fishing all tackle and you're using 50 pound braid, um, you can send, you know, it's going to be all that braided line connected to your leader and your hooks. Um, you know, that what we just described earlier would be specific to line classes. Okay. And then 
once we file and everything, so what is the filing processes, uh, process look like? Uh, do you, can we file online? Do we call you guys? Is there any specific way to do it that is more efficient than another? So uh, traditionally, uh, you'd have to you know, print out an application, fill out the application form, and then send everything into us with a package. Um, we recently created an online application portal, which right. has been, we've been using it for about a year and a half now, and it's been, it's been great. So what that allows you to do is you know, fill out all the information online. Um, you can actually upload your photos or any videos you have to that online portal, and you can submit and pay for the application through that online portal. Um, you will still, however, need to send in your tackle. But once you finish that application online, it'll give you a form you know, with a code that verifies that that's the record that you're applying for and you just put that form in a package with your tackle and send it into us and I'll actually get everything uh, on my end immediately as soon as you press submit and then you know usually take standard shipping for, for your stuff to arrive and it'll be uh, it'll be processed and show as pending. And then in the process of qualification um, you're usually in touch with the, the potential world record holders or like you get an uh, email conf uh, confirmation of these things? Yeah, so you get an email confirmation that your record has been submitted. Oftentimes, you know, people get excited about records and they'll reach out to me. Um, if, if anything, you know, on my end, if I need some more information from you, oftentimes, you know, I'll be reaching back out to you as the angler, asking for additional photos, um, you know, questioning any specifics that you may have on the record. Um, there's a lot of back and forth communication. So I want to make this clear. There is, um, these guys will make everything anything possible for, for you to qualify for that world record, right? So the feeling that I got since I got here today is like, they want people to get world records. So they're not trying to prove you wrong or, or nothing like that. What they want to do is make sure that you are in compliance with all the rules, but they actually help you to do that, right? Yeah. Like through the communication process. So don't be scared to, again, like call them, reach out to them, understanding the process. It's actually a super, it is a cool process because if you do get a world record, that stays there forever, right? Yeah, when, so. one of my favorite parts of this job is when someone will reach out to me and say, you know, Zach, uh, I've been fishing in this area and I've been getting, you know, some large uh, specimens of this, you know, individual species and I think I can get the all tack world record. You know, what do I have to do to go about it? And I explain to them the rules and regulations like we talk about here. And then, you know, I send them off and they go fishing and three, four weeks later, I get a call back and they're like, Zach, I got the fish, I got the fish. All right, I'm gonna send in the stuff just like we said. I got the photos that you asked for. Uh, and, and when to see it all come together from start to finish like that is it's awesome. Yeah, no, like you said, we we want people to be out there, you know, catching world records. It's it's what we do. And we just want you to be compliant with our rules and regulations, and we want everyone to be able to, you know, have the opportunity to get a record fish. Well, that's great. And just to recap a little bit, um, I want to put it out there. So we, the jigging community, um, there is so much potential for us for all these world records because. There are actually like a lot of the world records that have never been registered. There is a lot of species that we catch in pretty regular basis. There is actually no a record holder for it. Like nobody has a record, a world record for these fish. Um, um, I'll name some of them like around here so you guys can like get like excited about it. But like there is so much potential to catch world records on jig, and that's the whole point of this video. Like trying to get everybody to understand. Uh, the sport part of the jigging as well. And to apply what we love to do to the IGFA rules and actually making it legit, right? No, and, and uh, so something to keep in mind too is, is so if you go either you know through our book or our website, IGFA.org, and you search our World Records database, if you see a species of fish, or if you don't see, a species of fish in there, uh, and you know that you're catching them, that means that that record is vacant. No one has submitted one yet. So the minimum requirements are that that fish weighs more than a pound. Um, okay. So as long as you're catching a fish you know, that weighs more than a pound, you follow all of our rules and regulations, you, you, you get the, um, the photos that you need to get, um, you're compliant, and you send all that information into us, then you'll be able to earn that vacant record. Okay. Well, it sounds a lot simpler than I thought. Um, now. Um, is there any way, um, do you guys have a website and a membership as well? Uh, what is that like for the people that are willing to like get more involved in all of this? Like, what does that mean? Uh, how can you join? Uh, how can you become a member of the IGFA? Uh, what are the benefits of some of this yeah. stuff as well? So you can sign up online or, or through the phone. You can give us a call. You can even stop by in person and sign up. We have a digital membership, which gives you access to our website and our world record database through there. Um, we also have you know, a hard copy membership. Uh, that's the more traditional membership, which gives you a uh, copy of the book every year when it comes out. Um, you don't necessarily need to be a member of the IGFA to catch a world record. Um, you can actually sign up uh, to become a member once you catch that record, right? So, you know, in order to, to have a world record, you know, you have to sign up at, at some point. But you can be out fishing, you know, an everyday person and you can catch a, a world record fish. And, you know, through that application form, um, you can sign up to become an IGFA member.